I finally fell asleep around four in the morning, or at least I think I did. One moment I was staring into the darkness, thinking about those photographs, and the next, my phone was vibrating on the table next to me. Bleary-eyed, I reached for it and squinted as the light of the screen came on, blinding me. It was only 6.13am. An unknown number was calling me. I ignored it and set it back down. Not even a minute later, it was vibrating again. I sighed, slid it towards me, and pressed accept. Hello? Dr. Pike, sorry to wake you so early. It's Cooper. Hope you at least got some sleep. What? Oh, yeah, yes, I did. A beat passed, and then Cooper cleared his throat. Good, because I'm outside your apartment building. Um, what? I'm outside. They're waiting for us. Over the night, the past few hours, really, Upsweep has, um... His voice trailed off. Well, it's best I told you in person. I'm in the blackjack. Oh, and don't forget your towel. Ten minutes later, I was outside in the passenger seat of Cooper's sleek black car. The light from the sun was just beginning to peek out over the mountains, making the sky explode in brilliant purples and reds. Cooper wiggled the stick, shifted into first, and pulled out of the lot. I cracked the window and felt the cool morning air wash across my face, stirring me into wakefulness. So, he said, keeping his eyes on the road. The sound, upsweep, as I'm sure you know, it's been diminishing in volume since 1991, or so we thought. Turns out it wasn't getting quieter, it was moving away from PMEL, moving north from the coast of Antarctica towards Hawaii, which is why... Jaima heard it getting louder, I said, catching on, my eyes growing wide. Precisely, he said, shifting up third as we pulled out onto the highway. So, that means it's moving fast. Cooper glanced at me, concern clear in his expression. He shifted to fourth. Really goddamn fast, but that's not all. You'd expect something that big would affect its environment cause huge waves, disrupt the currents, even shift the weather pattern slightly. It's doing none of those things. It's like it isn't actually there, like it's just sliding through, cutting the waters. It's spooky. I looked at him in total disbelief. Yeah, that's pretty goddamn spooky. Where is it now? He looked at me, then back towards the road. The light from the rising sun was bright, angled and he flipped down the visor shading his eyes before saying about 350 nautical miles from the california coastline we pulled into the marina before the sun had fully risen i could see a sizable gray vessel and a small congregation of people standing by the dock in front of it some of them were wearing marine uniforms i looked questioningly at cooper he shrugged and said simply It's become a matter of interest to those who protect our national security. He parked and we got out, walking towards the group. I could see Joan Leo standing in the forefront, surrounded by a team of scientists. The marines stood by, watchful. A few were staring intently at Cooper. Dr. Pike, Cooper, good morning. Please, Leo said, gesturing behind her at the vessel. We're in a bit of a hurry. Luckily, the Navy has agreed to assist us with one of their vessels. It's faster. As we walked up the gangplank and onto the vessel, I felt a growing sense of dread rising up, threatening to take me over and turn me around back towards the safety of land. I ignored it and watched solemnly as they withdrew the plank and pushed off. The boat was fast, very fast. This way, we've set up in here. Leo led us towards the stern and into a well-equipped cabin, complete with a round table littered with paper graphs, sketches, pictures, pencils, and one very large, old-looking sexton. I could see that some of the charts represented the speed of the object. It was phenomenally fast. Leo turned to me as her team of scientists spread out to the different stations around the room. Some were observing sonar, Others were charting the topography of the ocean floor. I watched mesmerized, slightly in shock, unable to fully comprehend what was happening. 
Leo gestured to the table and the room at large. Up sweep central. We're trying to track it to see if it gets any closer to the coast, but it seems to have stopped over a fixed point. At first, it looked like it might have been moving with the ocean floor current, an inanimate object riding the tide. But it seems to have stopped at a fixed point, standing still against the current, which is strange to say the least. Leo sighed. She looked exhausted. Have any ideas, Dr. Pike? I glanced at Cooper. He was studying a few of the papers on the table. I looked back at Leo. Geologically wise, very, very few. I did have some, but its recent movements and changes have since ruled those out. Maybe it's some sort of animal we've yet to discover. Leo shook her head. Can't be. That big and that fast? Impossible. What do you think, Cooper? He set the papers down, looking thoughtful, then said in a measured tone, I think it's big and I think it's fast. I also think speculation ruins the surprise. Three hours passed in a frantic blur. The data we were receiving was wildly impossible. The sound the thing was making was off the charts and it seemed to have grown in size. The animals that were once congregating near it were swiftly leaving and we could see an uncountable number of whales, sharks and fish all swimming away from the direction we were heading. Sort of makes you wish you brought a fishing pole, Cooper said, peering wistfully out the cabin window towards the ocean below us. I shot him a look, unsure whether he was being serious or joking. He smiled. Really, Cooper? Leo said, bustling over with a stack of topography paper in her arms. No, I hate the ocean and fishing. Just trying to lighten the mood before our impending doom, he said, smiling wider. Before Leo could reply, an ear-splitting alarm sounded, making everyone cover their ears as pain etched its way swiftly across our faces. It cut off almost as suddenly as it had started, and the vessel slowed to a dead stop. A marine poked her head into the cabin and said urgently, You gotta see this. We all ran towards the door and down the length of the vessel, staring off the starboard side. Above us, the clouds were thickening, stirring, like they were brewing up a perfect storm. And I could clearly make out hundreds of birds, whirling, swirling above us like a cyclone. The water around us was dead still and mirror smooth, and strangely clear, like all the sand and the silt and the garbage had been sieved away, leaving it totally transparent. I looked into the depths and gasped. It was there, silent, strange. It was distorted in the water, but clearly the colour of night, or the void itself. It looked close enough to touch, like if I just leaned over the railing and eased my hand into the still waters, I would feel it slipping beneath my fingers, the consistency of goo. I shuddered. Holy shit, I whispered, watching as its image undulated in the water. It looked like some of the blackness was oozing out of it, rising in long tendrils towards us. No one spoke for a good ten minutes, before one of the marines called out the teams they would be sending out. But the two scientists Leo was going to send, scared from the sighting of the thing itself, backed out, saying it wasn't worth it, that they would just study it from the relative safety of the vessel. Leo herself was even apprehensive and looked around beseechingly to the other scientists. Many of them looked away or slyly returned to the cabin. Cooper glanced at me and raised his eyebrows. You want me to go down there? Not, I'll go with you. His voice was earnest, calm. I hesitated momentarily before nodding my head. Okay. As we walked towards the drop crane, Leo called out behind us. Oh, if it's possible to collect a sample of whatever that is, that would be ideal. That is a fantastic idea, Cooper said so seriously I'm sure he was being sarcastic. Leo didn't seem to notice, or if she did, she ignored him. We went down in four submersibles, 
two to each sub, all suited up just in case the worst happened. I hadn't dived in years and could feel my pulse quicken as our turn to enter the sub approached. We climbed in and Cooper took up the controls. My stomach dropped with the sub as we fell into the ocean and then kept falling. Down, down into the crystalline waters below. Around us, the lights from the other subs flickered and flashed in the water, reflected back to us at strange angles. Cooper eased the sub forward, seemingly a pro at the controls. Each sub headed in a different direction, while we headed straight down, directly towards it. Around us, I could almost feel the crushing weight of the water wholly encompassing us, making us slow. We were out of our element, and I was scared. Cooper steered beside me with vigilance, his breathing steady, measured, making me feel a little bit safer. He opened his mouth to say something, but before he could, I yelled with fright and pointed. The blackness was suddenly gone and was instead replaced by a sickly ruddy red colour that swiftly switched to a blinding white. Almost as soon as it had appeared, the white was gone and it was black again. A harsh static sputtered around us, making me jump. Then a voice rang out. All submersibles halt and resurface now. There was a bump from below and Cooper muttered, shit, trying to manoeuvre the sub upwards but it made a harsh grinding noise and the smell of something burning rose up around us. He looked at me, handed me my mask and said, How fast can you swim? Even through the wetsuit, I could feel the chill of the waters around us as we pushed ourselves through the open hatch of the sinking sub. Suddenly the current shifted and it felt warm, almost tropical. I began to swim, following the path Cooper was taking. And as I swam, I could hear three things. The sound of my own breathing, struggling to remain steady, calm. My heartbeat, loud, powerful, consistent, pulsing in my ears, pounding around in my skull. And finally, the eerie, haunting sound of the thing below. It sounded like it was calling out, asking questions, speaking. I fought the urge to look down, frightened that I might see it looking back, reaching out for me. I felt a sharp, painful tug on my arm, so powerful it swung me sideways, upsetting my mask, and I yelled out, feeling it fall from my face. Panicking now, I thrashed about, feeling myself being pulled downwards. And then suddenly, I wasn't. Suddenly my mask was being shoved onto my face and I opened my eyes. Cooper knife flashing in the distorted light around us, was expertly cutting at the blackened tendril wrapped around my arm. It extended all the way down to the oblong shape. It was white again, and I thought I could make out a dilated pupil looking up at us. There was a slight snapping noise, a high-pitched yammer, and the tendril retracted down, down, down. Finally loose, he tugged me upwards and we began to swim again. The tendril still wrapped around my arm was leaking a jelly-like purple substance that refused to mix with the water around us, sinking below like an unusual oil. We breached the surface and four different pairs of arms reached down and pulled us, sputtering and limp, onto the boat and then up onto the larger vessel. I lay there, my heart pounding painfully against my throat, rendering my voice useless. I felt a tug and looked to my left. Cooper was gently peeling the black tendril from my arm. He tossed it towards Leo, who stood close by, watching us with wide eyes. She made a squeaking noise and hopped back from it. Sample, Cooper breathed before leaning back against the railing and bursting out in uncontrollable laughter. I watched him for a moment, then joined in, feeling the laughter peel out of my belly, a gut reaction to our near brush with death, or worse. We laughed and laughed for a few good minutes, while the seabirds swirled overhead and the marines and scientists stood around us, dumbfounded. 
Those who were in the other subs were crowded on the other side of the deck, looking at us with round, frightened eyes. The sun melted slowly into the western horizon, colouring the sky an outrun pink and orange. When our laughter finally abated, he stood, helped me onto my feet, and together we looked out into that great expanse, constantly undulating, constantly shifting. It was, it is, unfathomable, mysterious, expertly hiding what lies beneath. Cooper inhaled deeply, ran a hand through his salt-stiff hair, suddenly serious, and said, Fuck the ocean. My feet touched the sweet sturdiness of the Santa Barbara coastline about three hours later. I wanted to lean down and kiss it, but thought it would look too cliché, so instead I opted for turning to Cooper and saying, I could use a stiff one right now. He nodded, absolutely. A tinny tune sounded, and Cooper pulled out his phone. Damn, maybe next time. Dr. Pike, a pleasure. He held out his hand and I shook it once, twice, before letting go. Call me if anything changes, he said again, turning towards his car and walking away. Thanks for saving my life, I called out after him. He gave me a quick thumbs up before sliding into his smooth black car. I watched him drive away into the night. I looked around, imploringly. Leo saw me and offered to take me home. Since then, I've been in contact with her and her team, unable to sleep, unable to even concentrate, speculate, imagine what it was we saw, what it was doing, why it attacked. The sample they collected has only added more mystery to what happened. At first, it didn't seem incredibly extraordinary, until one of the scientists discovered that its chemical makeup wasn't only organic, that it seemed, against all odds, mechanical. An organic machine. Even stranger is that all signs of it are totally gone, as if it never even existed in the first place. According to Leo, when we were pulled back onto the ship, it blinked and shot away unfathomably fast in the direction of the Mariana Trench. From the data collected and the way the sound slowly dissipated, Leo said they thought it might have sunk into the trench, that maybe it's hiding, waiting, reassessing. We can't see it anymore, but we can still hear it. That upsweep sounding noise is still being recorded to this very day, at this very moment. Quieter, farther away, but still there. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see if it comes back out again.